What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the Mehran Podcast. Today, my guest is Scott Reeves. Scott is an entrepreneur from Quebec with a big passion for action sports. He is the owner and co-founder of Access Board Shop. After many years of working in a shop while completing an engineering degree, Scott teamed up with two friends to start Access Board Shop in 2002. What started out of a passion for action sports turned into an immediate success. Access quickly became a staple in the Quebec action sports scene with their deep involvement in the free skiing, snowboarding, and skateboarding scene. After a decade in business, Access had a total of nine shops open in the province of Quebec before going back to only one physical location in the mid-2010s. Access is now over 20 years old and is still going strong in saint sauveur In this episode, we talked about a bunch of stuff. Scott's entrepreneurship story, opening a board shop in the early 2000s, the challenges of handling rapid growth in a business, the importance of giving back to the community, and much, much more. Shout out to the patrons on Patreon, Will Cameron, Raf Diaz, Laurent Olivier Martin, Holden Baldassi, Ryan Bruninghouse, Sam Chef, Nick Gosselin, and Wyatt Loney. Thanks to the sponsors, Planks Clothing, Dickens Restaurants, and Axis Board Shop. Let's go. Mr. Scott Reeves, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Xavier. Thanks for having me uh, on this. Yeah, man, I'm stoked to have you. A legend, local legend that people might not necessarily know, but I think a lot of people know uh, Axis Board Shop. Hopefully they do. Hopefully they do. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stoked to have you because we've had episodes with skiers that are young and some older. I've had episodes with photographers photogs with filmmakers and i think it was a really good idea you've been a sponsor of the podcast since the beginning and thank you for that but i just want to mention that you didn't ask to come on i actually asked you to come on because i think you have a really interesting story and i think this is going to be a great episode to talk maybe about the culture of the sport but from a business perspective maybe because you're a passionate guy you you're you're not a skier, you're a snowboarder, but still you're in the, the snow sport community that we all love. And you've been running your shop for now over 20 years, right? That's right. Yeah. We're, yeah, we clocked 20 this October. So yeah, on the 20th Going on right 21. Now. Going on 21. Yeah. So there's a lot to unpack before we go into running a shop, running a ski shop. Um, I think it's something that everyone can relate because I think every town that has skiing has a ski shop it's a uh, probably one of the most common businesses for skiing and snowboarding worldwide um and i think it's cool to get that story because i had never asked you and we never talked about it so i'm gonna have the the first hand uh, experience of learning also um tell me about young scott like you're from uh saint sauveur the saint sauveur area near montreal Tell me about um, how uh, young Scott got into the snow sports uh, life. Well, it's funny you mentioned that I'm a snowboarder, but I have to admit, and I think a lot of people know this, but I, I did have to go through the skiing first because back in the days, uh, back in those back in the early '80s, I mean, there wasn't much snowboarding going on, and my father wasn't really, or my family wasn't into snowboarding, or the 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 start of the snowboarding, you know, with Bert, Jake Burton and every, the, the rest of the queue. So yeah, no, I started ski racing when I was, well, not racing when I was two, but I started skiing when I was two and then, uh, raced all my way up till nine. And that's where I, yeah, nine, 10, that's where I switched to snowboarding. Cause the, the, fr there wasn't much freestyle in skiing yet. I mean, it was, I think it was just starting. I think maybe I, I would see Dorion, Cusson, and, and I didn't really know Paris at the time, but I'd see them on, on the, in the moguls, you know, and that would be the freestyle part of the skiing. And, but it was still pretty much structured and, and pretty much the same as the racing side, where it was more, maybe more rigid than, than what freestyle is supposed to be. Yeah. So I got out of there, jumped out, and then fell in love with the, uh, this, the snowboarding and the snowboard culture, you know? Yeah. I'm, maybe 10 years younger than you. And I, I had the same thing when I was a kid around the early 2000s. I had a, a season where 
before I got into free skiing where I tried snowboarding because it was what what felt more freestyle than the the racing vibe, let's say. Yep. And so you never you never had the gist to get back into skiing once you were on that you were you were hooked. I think we had we had some bets going. I went back maybe for one day in 2010 or something, and and I'm willing to do it again. I mean, I I'm not going to go back to skiing obviously because I love I lo I love being sideways. Like I surf, I try to skate, I try to surf. I'm not a you know I like being sideways, but yeah, well, for sure. I'll... Was something that felt more natural to you? Not necessarily because I mean. No, this is, this is a good question, but no, I just I like the I just like the feeling of, of being sideways, but but honestly, it's not that it's the same thing, but I'm pretty pretty sure it's the same thing. I mean, a, a good powder turn on a pair of skis or snowboard is a good powder turn, right? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Or a good, you know, nice air time is whatever you're floating in the air. Yeah, you see that sometimes when there's some pro skiers or pro snowboarder that switch sport for a day and. It's almost as if they can do the same tricks on them. Good. There's a there's a video of Burke Rude, who's like the top skier right now in the world. He's winning every slope style comp. And there's a side-by-side -side shot of him doing a dub, I think dub 14 maybe, on skis and also on a snowboard. And it's the same day. He just switched from board no to way. skis. Yeah. There's two yeah, there's two people that come to mine up north. There's Maud, uh, Maud, Mad Maud, Raymond. Yeah. She, she can carve a snowboard like better than most people can snowboarding, right? So she's really good on this. So she can switch back and forth to carving skis or snowboard. And there's Tom Galarno, a, a, a local almost, you know, he's, he's, you know, local pro, local hero. And he switches too from skiing to snowboarding really easily. So yeah, so um, let's take it. Yeah, from the, from Saint, well, not Saint Severe, but I mean, I guess people know a little more Saint Severe than, than Saint Adele, which is a city beside Saint Severe. Yeah, and yeah, Laurentian region, born, raised. I mean, since day one. I saw some videos of you once. Uh, I some '90s video of you competing in a in a snowboard comp. Um, and again, I'm going totally blind with that question. Was there ever some uh, competition aspirations from you? Like, what was your your snowboarding days? Maybe uh, in your teens. Like, did you ever aspire to become a pro or anything? Or it was just like some local stuff shredding around? It's fun. Those days, you don't, you didn't, I didn't aspire to be a pro. I just wanted some free shit. Oh. <laughs> right? So I just wanted some free gear and I want, like, you know, brands to give me some free stuff. But, uh, but yeah, no, I did compete like most people did, I guess, in the early days of snowboarding. And, and I thought I was good back then. When I look at it now, I was, I was okay. I mean, I wasn't bad, but I was, I wasn't nothing to, to make the world cup or especially not the Olympics. Yeah. To give people some context nowadays, if you want some attention, there's established brands, there's established shops, there's social media, there's YouTube. What was the life of a, a teenager, Scott? Um, how did you get free shit back in the days? What was the life to get attention from, from the industry? Yeah, that's a, that's a, actually an amazing question because it, it's different, but it's not that different from what it is right now. Because right now we're going around with with phones, right, and we're we're filming, editing on phones or whatever. I mean, maybe people have better equipment, but basic is that. But back in those days, it was you know camcorders, held handheld camcorders that we'd film each other, and then we'd wrap up two VCRs beside each other, and then you know play, record, play, record. And then we would do our own montages back in the early 90s, you know? Really? So it, it, things have changed, but not really. You, you were just, a, maybe it had a less user-friendly stuff, but you still managed to have the same end product? I think it's the same. Yeah, it's the same. Well, so no, obviously the end product is not the same because <laughs> you don't have the glitches in between the shots. You managed but... to came up with your edits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, your, yeah, se sure. your season promos, or I don't know how you, how did you call them back in the days? I guess it wasn't as official as a season promo because we didn't even know what those were back then. We were just trying to get some footies and then, you know, it's trying to, you know, have a, have a few laughs after a good day of riding, you know? So, yeah. yeah. But no, the industry was pretty, you know, it was pretty free back then. It wasn't, wasn't many guidelines or, you know, it was out and open, let's say. Yeah. For, for the best, in my opinion, but we can, we can touch on that later on. <laughs> well, t tell me, uh, Maybe we'll get to to compare later on with nowadays, but how how was it back then? 
you meaning how was the industry you mean well, yeah yeah well like again like i just said i think it was more more i guess more free more open more like you do what you want and it seems like maybe now there's more maybe guideline norms and maybe it's too structured or too no, i wouldn't say boxed in but almost you know that's what scares me a bit about our sports right now that are getting really a little too I don't know if the, the term boxed in is right, but I mean, you, you need to do certain things to, to get recognized. I got into judging this year and yeah. uh, last time I judged a comp was over 10 years ago and I really got hit with a difference because uh, it's basically all since the Olympics came in and that all trickled down to the local comps where now you got to have accreditations and you have ski clubs and uh, you need to have it, you know, it, there's a lot of rules that are not necessarily applied because there's still coaches that are, you know, from our generation. But in theory, you can't throw down a trick if it's not certified. And to like, it's all things that come from mogul and aerials, I feel like. But let's say a, a coach or someone could do, someone could file a complaint after a comp saying, hey, that kid didn't have the right to do his dub 10 because he doesn't have it on. The so anyways, there's a lot of processes that I was like, oh, fuck, we're, we're, we're at that point now. Well, not only that, I think, I mean, it's the sport is judged more now and it's skiing and snowboarding pretty much the same it, on, on the difficulty and execution and everything where before it was all style. And I, we need to get back to that somehow. You know, I think this, the style part of, of it has been forgotten and, and just unfortunately it has, you know, and, and a lot of people, the game has changed now. You can, you know, you can have any, any kid practicing in any airbag, any trick, you know, for a, a million times and he can probably go to the Olympics, but that doesn't mean he can ride properly. And now it's time for a first sponsor break. Dick Anne's is a family owned fast food restaurant chain with 12 locations in the Montreal region. Close to 70 years after opening their first restaurant on Montreal's Boulevard Pineuf, Dickens is still focused on what matters. The same great menu with great food made with quality ingredients. I've said it, I'm a Dickens super fan, and many people ask me what's my go-to. I have to say it's their famous Wally Burger. A double cheeseburger with slices of pepperoni. It's so good. Dickens is now selling their sauce in their restaurants and in many metro grocery stores throughout Quebec. Plus, they've put a bunch of great recipes to go along with it on their website at dickandsauce.com. Also big news, their St. Jérôme location is reopened. Same location, brand new building. Go check them out when you pass by St. Jérôme. Support companies who support skiing. Support Dickand's restaurants. Yeah, well, the, I, I totally agree. That's something I definitely saw is as much as places like Maximize are, uh, you know, a super great thing. Don't get me wrong. It's insane for the sport and for the kids and for local kids. But at Maximize, you get the in-run for the jump, the jump and the out-run, and you repeat. So there's no point in your day or your week if you go there where you actually ride. So I saw some kids this year that in between hits in a slope style run or in a half pipe run where you were like, oh shit, you need to do more riding because I'm... I'm not I'm not convinced that you know how to ride. Well, and here's the thing, it's like I'm not taking away anything from these people because obviously they're they're high level athletes, right? Yeah. So so what they're doing, I can't even even imagine I could do one day. I could not I could never do what they do, right? Yeah. But but personally, that's not what I want to see. Mm -hmm. Like I turn on flip on the X games. I'm not sure if that's what I want. The product is not what I used, you know, so it's it, yeah. the product has changed. So I guess if the mass wants to see that, then that's fine. What what do I have to say with it? But it seems that the more and more people I talk to around me, that's not necessarily what people want to see. It's just maybe a way to get the, the get you know contests or whatever in a in a box where it's easier for for for, for the people organizing to judge or like yeah, I don't know. Package I don't it. know. Yeah, to package it, in, in, but it's we're not yeah. packageable. But I, I think you, I think if you'd have to ask the, the, a broad spectrum of people, what gets people going is when you see that technicality, but also mixed with some riding. Yeah, um, you know, there's uh, on the snowboarding side, there's the supernatural comp. Is that yeah. the name? Yeah, we're like yeah. you see technical stuff, but you actually can't get down to a certain hit if you don't know how to ride properly. So it like mixes the two. 
natural selection. Super, yeah, natural selection. Na- or, natural selection. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's 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 an amazing example. And I know it's it's harder to see, but I mean, it's harder to uh, not to see, but it's harder to have host those kinds of contests because it's. I mean, it implicates a lot, a yeah. lot of more things than just a big air or whatever. But yeah, you need but, to be yeah. in the back country. You need to have good snow conditions. I guess no. I guess I, I mean they're all good. I mean, I mean everything's good for the industry. It just I guess they. I, I wish they'd put more place more important on style and and you know nice grabs and longer grabs maybe. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what it's all about. Who yeah. knows? I guess my my uh, I totally agree with you. My two cents of being on the other side this season is that the um, with style the risk is getting into really a biased territory of like you know. Someone might do a trick super clean, but it's not your favorite style. And then what? how are you supposed to judge that? Are you going to be harsh to him just because you don't like his style? But Yeah, I get that. that, no, that, that, that that's pretty subjective. So yep. it's such a hard territory. Basically, in skiing right now, style goes under execution. So it's like part of, you know, was your trick well done and everything? But I think style is always going to go back to maybe, you know, less structured events and filming. Because again, yeah, yeah. Inside, of, inside of filming, the people speak. It's like, do you enjoy that video? If if people enjoy it, it's going to get a lot of views and you know, it's going to yeah. speak by itself. But yeah, that's the, it, it's a hard thing, man. Yeah. It's so a, let's say so we're going back and forth here. And, and you said before, like I, I was the first one to, to not the first sponsor, but I, I mean, I jumped on, you know, um, helping out this podcast, but we, we did business back in the days. I mean, with the, the, the ski movies, right? Yeah. So where I want to go with this is is it seems like there's more money right now in contests versus those videos and I think those videos are really important part of our culture and it seems now like everything is is built into shorts mm-hmm. so you know anything under a minute and it's it's fast food and it's it's consumed rapidly but it just doesn't seem like you get into you don't seem to get into it as much as uh, a movie like back in the days and you know mm-hmm. Well, I'm I'm not I'm not as much I don't have as much knowledge of what's going on in snowboarding to be frank, but in skiing there's a lot of good things that that are going on right now on the the online free content on YouTube. Every fall there's like dozens of great short movies. I think it's just a matter of the industry adapting to um, you know, there's been a big clash with, you know, going from selling DVDs with ski movies 15 years ago to now of companies adapting their marketing you know back in the days it was like oh let's spend a 10 grand to pay this company to to make a movie and the movie will sell worldwide it was pretty straightforward and now between facebook and instagram and tiktok and youtube and athletes making their own content and i think there's just a big adaptation that's still not completely done but i think we're on the right track skiing wise because there's insane content for for kids that want to get stoked on it's endless right now the only thing is how do you reassess the business model so that athletes get compensated for that it's hard to it's hard to track value these days for the athletes that's what i I find and as a filmmaker also it's like we're we're in the sea competing with like tiktok chefs doing uh doing meal content and you know we're in the you're not just competing with skiing content or snow sports content you're competing with any kind of content that'll capture your yeah. Yeah, your attention. No, I, I get what you're saying. I guess I guess shops could have like a, a more important role in this, where you know you used to walk in a shop and there'd always be a VHS or a DVD playing of that you know current season skate movie or snowboard or ski movie. And right now it, it's not the case. And and I told myself that I wanted to go back there. I just need to to do it. I think it's important for the industry to do it because, like you said, I think it will it will put more value on it. And then, you know, make the wheel yeah. turn, like we say. And now it's time for another sponsor break. Axis Board Shop has been dedicated to free skiing since its inception in 2002. At a time when some people and brands were still looking down on free skiing, Axis believed in it fully. After 20 years of supporting athletes, movies, competitions, events, and so much more, Axis is still going strong. Above all, Axis is a ski shop where you'll find everything you need for skiing, snowboarding, or skateboarding. Check them out in store in Saint Sauveur or online at accessboutique.com. Support companies who support skiing. Support Access Board Shop. 
we, we branched off and I love that, but I, I also want to keep track of, of your story because I think yeah, that, yeah, that's yeah. really good. Um, in 2002, you started Axis Boutique, Board Shop, however we want to call it. What led up to that? Um, I think, maybe I'm wrong, you studied, you have an engineering degree. Hells yeah, dude. Yeah. Fin actually finished the engineering degree while I was opening up the shop in 2002. So finish the engineering degree in 2003. Dude, that's a boss move. So again, I'm going to put in a lot of stuff. I'll let you answer how you wish. The the parents' pressure, maybe the, the school pressure of you've studied engineering is not an easy degree to get. It's a lot of work. And it's also a lot of great career opportunities. You can get some good money. What leads you to, at the same time of that, launching a ski shop? And not only are you launching a ski shop, you're launching it in Saint Sauveur, where there's competition infinite. A lot of things to a lot of things to talk about in, the, in that. <laughs> a lot of things to talk about. First of all, I think like I've fell in love with with surfing and skateboarding when I was I think eight, right? So yeah, from that from that moment on, I was hooked on this industry. So. I'll, I'll use a really very large industry of skiing, snowboarding, skateboarding, surfing, and then, you know, the BMX motocross came in at, at least. Let's say action sports culture. I don't, yeah, let's say, let's say well, action sports culture. How, how would you call it? Well, pretty much that. <laughs> so you're right. So I fell in love with that. Uh, and so I knew, and, and I was an entrepreneur from like fucking day one. I used to sell, you know, Cokes and, and, uh, and um and sandwiches at my father's football games to, to make extra money and then pick up golf balls and sell them and then you know uh mow lawns and i i i knew i i I'd wanted to work for myself i'd also work for other people and you know, on a whatever lifeguarding job or whatever but i i really enjoyed being my own boss yeah so even though i was studying to be an engineer i think that was more like to um i guess to get a degree like a plan b And, and I, I, a lot of people talk to me about schooling and I'm like, in, I mean, fuck. what they teach in school a lot of times is it's pretty much bullshit, right? But you need to go through that process to learn how to learn. And that's the most important thing. So what, whatever program or whatever you're in from, from the hardest to the easiest, I mean, just stick, stick with it and that'll teach you something and that it'll teach you to be more disciplined and, and to, to have the, um, um, to, to, to the livrable. How do you say livrab? Uh, deliverables. Deliverables, yeah. Yeah. And, and and that'll teach you a lot in life. And that's I guess that's why I got through the university part because it was long. It was long and technical though, with that engineering. So that plan B was good. Yeah. So if we go back to the scene back then, I mean, I, I was working at the local board shop, uh, which is called uh, Performance. You worked uh, there. I didn't know uh, that. Oh, yeah. Dude, you didn't know that. Okay. I didn't so, know that. Oh, the way. Was said that. Hold on here. <laughs> me, me, and Schwinn both worked there. Schwinn, Schwinn was also uh, one of the co-founder of Axis. Exactly. So me and Schwinn worked there. I, I'd been working there for maybe I don't know, um, at least I guess six, seven years. And Schwinn had been working there for five years. So we pretty much knew the the the, the, the local the local business, I'd say, and and how things worked and how a shop would work. So we had some some basic knowledge. And like you said before, I mean, it was a lot of competition. There was a lot of competition, maybe in terms of ski ski being sold, but freestyle skis being sold, yeah. there were none. Well, it it still didn't exist, really. Well, it, 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 it was it was new. It was still it was, like it was starting, right? So yeah, finishing up a university, and and obviously my parents have always been really supportive of anything I do, so. It wasn't like a pressure to, to finish off school. It was more like, well, yeah, you want to start a shop? Okay, try that. And if that doesn't work, at least you have the other. So I just want to give a shout out to them for, for giving me that opportunity to, to, to at least have the, uh, to have the backing, the, the moral backing of, of starting a shop. So, so the other missing part of that, so me and Schwinn work at Peffel Mouse, a local board shop. And then the other missing part of that that people don't really know about, or some do, is um, Exod. I don't know if you've ever heard about that shop. No. So Exod was Alex Giroux, and I don't know if uh, Libouaron was in, involved with that with him. He was involved with him, but I don't know, like financially, you're just helping him out finding a, a, a shop, a physical shop to sell at. But he opened up a shop for six months in Saint-Sauveur. Okay. 
And he, what he did was that Alex Giroud, he had freestyle skis, so twin tips, whatever, you know, a little bit of mogul maybe, but he had all the, the snowboarding brands out of wear in his shop. So Foursquare Forum and it, somehow he kind of weaseled his way in, in distributors and, and, and told them he had, he had a, a shop. And I'm pretty sure he didn't mention it very loudly that it was a ski shop because let's be honest, back then it was still a big ra- rivalry between both. So anyways, he had skis and, and jackets and he was selling in a shop in St. Severe, but it was really, really, you know, low, low uh, volume. But when I saw that in 2000, I guess it was the winter of 2002. Yeah, because we opened in the fall of 2002. When I saw that in the winter of 2002, I was like, hey, what? wait a sec. That's, that's my dream. I want a shop. You know, I want a brand. Why the hell is he doing it? And I'm not doing it yet, you know? Mm-hmm. So it kind of got me fired up. And, and then, you know, one plus one, some, some things happened with the, my old boss at, at, at Performance and from, for another business. But he kind of, you know, ticked me off in the wrong way. So it kind of gave me the, uh, the opportunity. and and The tick to say, F you, I'm going to do my own yeah, thing. Yeah, and he was a really good guy. So I kind of I kind of feel bad because, I mean, I, I know now from the other perspective, from the, from the other angle that not, you know, being a boss, you don't always want to do a bad thing. It's just sometimes there's so many, so much stuff going on that you, you do make wrong decisions, bad decisions. And it wasn't, there was nothing personal, but I took it personal. So that's why I said, F you, I'm starting my own shop. Yeah. So started the shop, didn't start the shop, but kind of had the excuse to start the shop. And so went to Schwinn, which was the manager at Tafa Mouse back then. I was finishing up and, and, and then talked to Alex and said, well, okay, guys, it's, Let's do it. Ski and snowboarding hadn't been done. Yeah, I, like I, 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 I'll talk about the Eastern Canada because I don't really know, you know, the the rest of the California scene or you know out west or whatever. But I'm pretty sure like we were one of the first shops to merge both free style skiing and snowboarding. Yeah, together, and that was that was not received well with many people back then. I mean, many snowboarders, I'm guessing. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're right. Many snowboarders, but even like maybe more, you know, uh, even some skiers, snowboarders still were, you know, were were not accepted that well. You know, there were still the the bad boys of the industry. So, And now it's time for another sponsor break. I love Planks Clothing. I've been using their gear for three seasons now, and I only have great things to say. Great, stylish products that get the job done, whether I'm skiing on the hill or filming street with the boys. Spring season is upon us and Planks Clothing is here with a new streetwear drop on their website. Made from 100% organic cotton, these hoodies and t-shirts will keep you looking fresh for seasons to come. My favorite one is the smiley hoodie that I'll be rocking for sure this coming spring and summer. Check out the new streetwear drop at planksclothing.com. Support companies who support skiing, support Planks Clothing. Tell me where where does the idea to sell skis and snowboard come from? Because like the first twin tip, is the the Salomon 1080 and it's 98. So going there, it's like twin tips have existed for four years, going on five. Um, as you said, there's there's a big beef or like you know clash in the culture between snowboarding and skiing. Uh, for for kids that might not be aware, for a long time in snow parks, skiing wasn't allowed. It was a snowboarding place. Um, where does it come from? You to say, okay, we're gonna sell both. Was it a business thing, like, you know, thinking really rationally about money? Was it uh, a cultural thing? Because I know you're you're someone that likes to gather people together. You know, you're not... Yeah, I, I, I like hearing you say that. I, I do believe I'd like to not gather, but I, I'd rather, you know, promote peace and war. So, yeah, I, I do want I, I like... Um, but to go back on that, um, it's funny now because I realize it more and more. I guess I didn't... I, unconsciously knew it back then but i had a whole bunch of friends skiers and obviously we were hardcore in the snowboard industry right because you said you mentioned before like oh well skiers weren't allowed in snow parks well when i started snowboarding i wasn't allowed on every hill even now i'm not allowed on every hill in the mm-hmm. states right There's yeah Al- Al- alta or i think glenn, so Mad-, Mad river glen i think doesn't allow snowboarding anyways it doesn't matter really but so so where I was going with this is that I had some skier friends. I was, you know, really in the snowboard industry, snowboard culture, let's call it. And 
and and you know flipping off skiers left and right but i i wouldn't flip off my friend that still he was skiing but had the same mentality as me right mm -hmm. and it was the same thing for my partner schwinn and, and, and you alex I, I you know alex which was the other partner i knew him i'd been skiing with him snowboarding with him you know for a while and, and schwinn was really good friends with um he went to school with um cusson and dorian vincent dorian and jeff cusson and Poirier too, I think, and Phil Poirier. So he was really close to those guys. So he saw the evolution of skiing and he understood that evolution and, and he could see like, they wanted to be like us. We wanted, you know, we wanted to be like skateboarders and it was all like intertwined, you know, it was all, you know, linked together. And I remember Dorian used to, used to switch from skiing to snowboarding just to go up in the, 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 the snow park, you know, and, and, Even though he wasn't allowed on skis, I mean, the, the, he'd had like a free pass sometimes to, to ride it on a ski, you know, on, on skis because he could, you know, properly, you know, rip, uh, you know, destroy those jumps. You know, he could probably, he could do like really cool things that snowboarder, even snowboarders respected. So, so for us, I guess it was a no brainer matching both because we knew friends that did both and, and had friends in the culture that did, you know, not both, but that were skiers or were snowboarders. And so, so, so we kind of, we kind of saw the opportunity there where like, we're all the same. I mean, if, if you love this culture and you're like, it doesn't matter if you ski or snowboard, in my opinion. And, and what I realize now and that there's, you know, there's, <laughs> there's, I think there's idiots on, in boat sports. There's, you know, there's certain people I don't want to deal with in boat sports. I'd rather, you know, deal with skiers in, in a certain aspect than snowboarders in certain that, you know? Yeah, it's more, it's not necessarily the sport you're doing. It's just your attitude and your, your way of being. I think it is, yeah. I think it is. I think for a lot of people, um, back in the days, they saw skiing as something cool, whereas, I don't know how to phrase that. It's as if for certain people, it took longer to kind of respect that there is something cool to free skiing. You know, and you, you still see some comments like X Games post something that free skiing wise and someone says, oh, yeah, that's whack. It looks like rollerblading. So it seems like it's it almost goes back to, you know, the, the whole rollerblading versus skateboarding beef that there was in the 90s, let's say, maybe nine, yeah. Late 90s. Yeah. 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 Thing is, is that rollerblading kind of disappeared, right? Yeah, I get a feeling it disappeared. Skiing never disappeared; it just grew stronger. And when you, when you, it's a good analogy when you talk about the X Games. I mean, you look at it. I mean, there's some snowboarders there with some whack style. Like they're, they're, they might be bitching about skiing that looks like rollerblading because not, in my opinion, not all skiing looks good. But same thing for snowboarding. There's some snowboarders aren't looking good at all either. So I mean, wh where do you go with that? You know, that's like I said before. Like I think there's. It depends on that that person on on the the the, the, the it depends on this the, the rider. I mean, some rider will make it look good, some riders won't, in my opinion. But like you mentioned before, that's all about style, and it all goes to personal judgment. And I guess everybody has an opinion on that. Tell me about the process of launching it, because last you said was you you were talking with Schwinn, your partner, um, saying "f you" to to the shop you were working at. Let's launch something. So from that first gist of anger and motivation to getting to an actual shop running tell me about getting that started wow again a lot of things to talk about but yeah um so i guess to start off with as like you mentioned that like a lot of people it was against the grain it wasn't that against the grain because a lot of skiers would shop at that local shop so apart from you know uh, we already had about I don't know, a third of that market, you know, we weren't selling the actual physical skis, but they were buying, you know, snowboard or, or whatever, surf, skate apparel. So we had that part. And then, so the other thing was that we didn't, we didn't find at that time, but I understand now that it's a lot of money and time and implication that, 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 that previous owner, but that previous owner for Perform House wasn't investing enough in the industry and giving back enough via contests or via events or via sponsorship not money but sponsorship giving out gear to, to riders but but he was you know when i come to think about it he was he was doing the right thing we, we were the thing is that we were holding those events you know we were organizing those events so if we were going to do it for somebody else why not just do them for for ourselves you know so anyways we we opened that we opened the shop 2002 november november 22 2002 
we opened it with that mentality of giving as much back to the community as we could, local community, local culture. So skiing, snowboarding, skateboarding, the three pillars. And so we, we came, I think since day one, we, we picked up, I think Remo was on the team and he's, you know, popping up back then and, and a few more local heroes, you know, supporting a whole bunch of local athletes higher level athletes. Schwinn back then was pretty good. Also, he's in local regional snowboard movies. The local crew was really involved already in that, uh, in the local, I'd say even provincial scene. So we kind of opened up with a boom, meaning that we already had the effectives in terms of, you know, uh, presence wise on the hills and in, in the local scene movies. So yeah, I think obviously we didn't have enough probably inventory when we opened up. Shop was half full, you know, didn't have, but people would just would buy anything that, that, that would represent us, you know, not us, but uh, people trying to push that, you know, that the community, the culture. Mm -hmm. So we'd have, we'd have shitty t-shirts, shitty access t-shirts and shitty joggers, you know, to start off because then we got, we got better at it. But then people would just eat them up, you know, even if it weren't, weren't the right size, you know. I think that's something that always stood out for me and uh, curious to have your 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 explanations on that, on where it comes from. But I've seen a lot of shops in my life that sell products, sell boots or skis or whatever and limit themselves to that. And a big part of how the Axis brand was pushed, I feel like, is you guys had almost your own clothing line. Like you guys were producing hoodies and t-shirts and pants and you could basically be dressed from head to toe in stylish axis gear that evolved with like the fashion trends. So like you'd go to the hill and the local hero wasn't wearing a Oakley jacket. He was repping axis. Yeah. Well, a few things there. First thing is that a lot of people will open a business They'll, they'll run their business, but they won't run it as a brand. And the, we opened it as a brand, not as a snowboard shop. And was that, con was that a conscious thing or how, how did that come to life? I guess we were always pushing brands and, you know, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's funny because it wasn't really a conscious thing. It was just more of a natural thing, you know. You open up your shop, you have the stickers of your shop. You open up your shop, you have, you know, hoodies, t-shirts, hundred, basically, you know, that's yeah. always in every color, you know, in every size and color. We got, you know, we got the, the bad end out of that where we couldn't keep stock enough to, to have that. But anyways, that's another subject. So, so opening up a business, not a business, but a shop, but mostly a brand. And the other thing was a lot of times it seems like, We were, we were, I guess we were younger and more in touch with what, what, what our friends wanted and what we wanted back then. And, and sometimes the industry doesn't adapt as quickly to what, to the, to the wants and needs of those, of those riders, those kids. And, and that's kind of a bit like what happened back in, in those days where, you know, when we, the joggers, we, I don't know if you remember the joggers with the cargo pockets. And no, no, no other brand was doing it, you know, back then. So, so we said, well, it'd be cool to have a jogger, you know, have a cargo pocket and, you know, have it baggy and this and that. And we said, well, nobody's doing it. And we tried to do it locally. Nobody would do it. So why not, you know, just make it. Mm -hmm. And then boom, you know, it took off. We had, um, I think we were a victim of, of the success, meaning that we couldn't keep stock on enough product. Yeah. It, it would come in and, and it would sell so quickly that we'd always be out of stock in certain sizes. Yeah. And to touch base on that is so we obviously we were selling in every uh, access shop and, and satellite shop, but we were also trying a distribution out uh, out in Europe mm. with um, I, I had Dre in, in mind, but I forget what their distributor was. It was in Swiss and and Switzerland. We had friends that had new people out there, and and we couldn't feed them enough product. They they placed us a booking for for next to the upcoming season and we didn't have enough product to ship them or we'd ship them like um sizes that sizings that weren't ordered originally so we could have had success selling it as a brand out in europe but we never did because we didn't we didn't deliver we didn't um op operation wise here wasn't you know a fine keep up. enough couldn't keep up right so, so we missed we missed the boat on that we blew it big time 
you guys were hitting the the nail right on the nail. What's the expression? Sure, you you sure. guys were, were really on point, trend wise, fashion wise, because the number of edits I saw in new schoolers where uh, Dom Laporte or Belmar or some someone was repping the clothing and everyone was like, "What's that AS? I, that's so sick! I, I want that!" And everyone was like, "It was grabbing people's attention. Like, what is that?" Yeah, exactly. And that's I think that's where we miss a boat. Is like, I it was it was pushed locally, mm -hmm. maybe too much, and it got into everybody's hand locally. Yeah, where you'd be riding in your car and you'd see somebody on the sidewalk repping that big logo where you're like, well, that person really shouldn't, you know, it's, it's not like I want my clothes on certain people, but like you don't want it on everybody. Because then once you have it on everybody, it's not exclusive anymore. Or it's, it doesn't have the, the, it doesn't have the, the special, you know. Yeah. It, yeah. The, the brand loses it, its, uh, it loses its, I lost its it, appeal? I guess, I don't know. appeal maybe. Yeah. So, so we overproduced locally, underproduced internationally. Mm. And that whole thing kind of imploded at the same time as all the shops imploded. Well, you're getting ahead of yourself, but I, that's something interesting that I want to touch on. Um, basically, right now, you're in a, uh, a space where the shop is that is not the original one. When you opened in 2002, you were in a small, like, I don't know how many square feet, maybe a thousand, two thousand square feet. A thousand two hundred square feet, yeah. Yeah. Crammed, so, crammed in there. <laughs> small shop, but that was really core. People, kids would get in, sit on the couch, watch movies. As you said, you build a hype. It was an instant success. I remember being a part of that generation. Every kid in town wanted to go there, wanted to buy there. I think my, my bro brother bought his first twin tips that were four fronts there. Like it was, you were in a good timing. Maybe I'm going to branch off on that because it's a, I think it's a good subject. Not only did you have to start a shop selling a new sport, aka free skiing, but you were also selling with new brands that were just starting off as well. Like you're a new shop starting off selling like Armada. Yeah. That is also a new brand that, that has just come to life. How was that? Because nowadays and for a long time, if I think of Armada in Quebec, I think of you guys because I think you're you're maybe the shop that sells the most and you're associated with them. But How was it getting that relationship started when Armada was just getting started? I think I think we kind of knew the brand was going to take off also because they they were also doing their homework. They were also gathering the right pieces of the puzzle together, right? They had all the riders, they had the style, they had the I mean the fucking skis looked amazing, right? Yeah. Everybody wanted to ride them. The skis the quality was all right. It was good. And so yeah, we I guess like some brands obviously we tried to push back in the days never succeeded but i think the better ones did and and you know it's good yeah say i think pretty much the same as us maybe they they were also a victim of their own success where they, they didn't almost have enough product we would be sold out of skis every year and then you grew really quickly where from 2002 starting your shop is it around 2007 2008 You open, you moved to a bigger space that was maybe six times, seven times the size of the original. Yeah, that that one wasn't that one wasn't the issue because we 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 had outgrown that shop for sure. So we had to move. We moved into an eight thousand square feet space versus the thousand four. But that thousand four was like you know it was, everything was jam packed in. Yeah, it but I mean, it's a good testimony of success of a starting business. If inside five years you move to a space that's You know, what is inside it? Three, yeah, yeah, inside two years and a half. But yeah, every, yeah, two years and a half. I thought it took longer. No, 2002, and we moved there, I think 2005, that summer 2000. So we started basically beginning 2002, uh, sorry, at the end of 2002, November, and we moved to that shop in June 2006. So yeah, pretty much, I guess, four years, I guess. But we were in the building for, um, I think I think we were there's some there's some good things with that and there's some negative things. We grew, would it almost grew too fast that we didn't have time to learn from our mistakes or we 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 had we hadn't had enough lessons yet to teach us how to how to do business better. Yeah. I don't like that term but like uh, there was a lot of loose parts, a lot of loose parts. 
for a young a, a young entrepreneur in 2023 what's some some lessons that you've learned of like starting a business and growing it you know if you look back on the first couple of years i know you could write, you you could maybe write a book with all all the experiences yeah, you've no, had but well, yes and no meaning that every any any business will have its own path you know and or, yeah. or every person will have its own path and what happened with us is that we had instant instantaneous success yeah and and that that caused us to maybe not care enough about where the money went back mm -hmm. in that in those days, meaning that sky was the limit. Yeah. We could we could put access on anything; it would sell in the store. Whatever brand we think we would sell well, we bring in; it would sell in the store. Mm. So for us, sky was a limit, and and there there was no limit, which was a huge problem, right? Not not locally where we moved to that new shop, but mostly where we opened up too many shops at the same time within a certain region without analyzing the local market yeah under financed under business educated because i had a business a engineering's degree right and i mean yeah under guided probably like everybody was like everybody was pretty much on the same note meaning that well oh yeah well the sky's the limit you know you've got you know the van des voiles like they say in french like yeah You've got so much momentum. Don't stop that momentum. Well, no. At, at a certain point, you gotta. How did they say? Is it a strike while the iron is hot? Something like that. Yeah. Well, you don't want to strike it too hard because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna lose some pieces, <laughs> and yeah. that's what happened. Yeah. So basically, g give us some context. Because I know a bit of that story, but for for people who are not familiar, you start in 2002. You grow the shop to moving to a space really quickly you're having a lot of success and then you're like what if we open other accesses well yeah so it wasn't that way it was it was Tell everybody me. everybody wanted a piece of it so everybody wanted a franchise mm. so when when friends friends would approach us we'd say well yeah i mean you're a good friend sure have a franchise here we go you know write down a rough contract on this you know but nothing official really or nothing Nothing. We wouldn't really study the the place where they'd want to open and and study the market there or ask them for for well, okay, well, how are you going to back that shop in the long run? You know, or you know, a lot of loose pieces, a lot of loose. Um, so so things didn't didn't mostly go well on that. So opened the shop. Uh, was it Trombley or Blainville first? I think it was Blainville, but that was a franchise. Opened up a franchise also in Trombla. The local hill asked us to kind of co-brand the local little uh, shop at the bottom of the hill. Yeah. So, I mean, for any, you know, businessman that has more experience than us back then, they'd always, they'd already raise a flag there, meaning like, wait, wait a sec, are you controlling your image? Are you controlling your brand? Because you're branching off in so many different places in the local market. So what you're saying for people who are not necessarily a uh... Uh, knowledgeable about the Quebec geography, you opened inside of a very short span of time four shop inside of a sixty mile radius. Exactly. Yeah, even less than that because sixty kilometers, uh, I guess forty forty miles is Montreal. So I'd say probably twenty five miles. Yeah, but let's Blainville. say between Blainville and Tremblant, like yeah. the, big, the big. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, that, so that's close, right? So. Obviously, um, the internet wasn't really a factor back then. It was. It was starting. For a funny side note, the uh, Shopify, you know, that the biggest platform online that mm -hmm. sells, uh, they were snowboard shop owners at the same time that started as us. Really? That also, that also needed a platform to sell online that wasn't available. So they created that platform. So that's where, where I'm running the parallel here is that we I, I knew we needed to be online, but we didn't have the we didn't have the tools and we didn't have the the platform to run it on back then. So we focused more on the physical sides of opening shops and and yeah, that didn't I guess that didn't go not it didn't go well. It went well for a bit, but then it kind of you know took a wrong turn. I'll let you share as much or as little as you want, but basically that's something that from the outside was It was nice to see like the ambition that you guys had because you went from one shop to to the peak before you, you kind of downsized again. Well, how many access shops were there? Seven? 
there you go. We went up to, let's say with the online business, because at some point somebody approached us and said, well, I want to run the online business. So we kind of treated that as a franchise also. We had nine shops, nine. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, Rouen, um, Val d'Or, Valleyfield, saint Dorothy, Laval, online, and then all the rest that I mentioned before. And then, boom, it imploded. 2000, I guess I'd say 2011. So, yeah, around 2010. Yeah. Right after the, the kind of the, the, what do they call it in the States? The, the, the recession? Break. The, wow. Was it the Great Recession? Yeah, two thousand eight was the Great Recession. Yeah, the banking crash or the the, 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 the house uh, housing market crash. Exactly. So that was that was hard for the states. So I kind of kind of thought that it was going to be really hard for us. Also, turns out I don't think it was that bad in two thousand ten because a whole bunch of shops, you know, really managed well through that. You know, through those years. So it wasn't the industry at all. Maybe it sold down a bit. The growth sold down, but not like it didn't dip. Mm -hmm. So the reason why everything went under is because it was, like I said, you lose, lose control of your brand, lose, lose, and then you, 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 um, we used to flow those stores of Axis gear, and then those stores weren't necessarily running their business tight, so they'd pay other product with sales from Axis, so they wouldn't pay us. Mm. And so we'd be financing the access gear that be selling there that we wouldn't have any money for. Plus they weren't paying us royalties because they didn't have money, you know, money to pay us royalties. So, so, so that, that didn't go very well, obviously. And then there was two corporate shops that we opened up in Laval and St. Dorothy. And those were just, that, that was probably the biggest mistakes that we made in those days is that opening up those two shops, which was a market that has never worked for snowboarding or skiing or, skateboarding but so many shops have been through there and none of them have really succeeded yeah so basically um between montreal and the laurentians you go from towns that are really not skiing centric or you know snow sport centric to you get in the laurentians you get to towns that are every that are you know fully into snow sports everyone skis everyone snowboards so in that transition you open two stores in laval which is Montreal suburb that's really a town of its own and kind of miss miss uh how, how would you qualify it like you went into a market that's not you were testing out if it, if it could work for a snow sport shop good I, I guess we we <laughs> biggest mistake we didn't have that reflection <laughs> we just said <laughs> oh somebody came up to us one of our partners there oh we got I gotta let's open up in Laval we've got a space and then And then we were like, Schwinn, my partner, was the one on the brakes. And and I was like, no, okay, well, we've got the momentum. Let's go. Let's open, mm. you know? Because why uh, why Laval and not Montreal? Why not the big city? Good question. I guess it's closer to us. You know, it's not that far away. It's not that, you know, Montreal is pretty much not an unknown, but where would you open a, a big surface in Montreal? Good question. Like all those, all those super centers were blowing up, right? And so, okay, let's be part of a super center. I mean, that seems to be the trend. And then what happens in those is that you just, it's a money pit. And we see it now that a lot of those spaces are, are free, you know, or, or, or aren't retail spaces or more like governmental spaces. So yeah, invested in there, underfinanced, uh, understudied. And then, yeah, those just kind of went sour. And then that affected also the, the production of the Axis brand. We didn't, we couldn't, we didn't have as much, as much cash hold to produce Axis gear. Yeah. So that went down. So everything kind of kind of went down slope from there, 2014. And yeah, we imploded back to one shop in Saint Sever, not in the original spot, but like two kilometers away, two miles away. So well, in the same spot that you've been since 06. Since 06, exactly. Yeah. And we took back the control of all the online operations, which was also necessary to, to control our image and to control the inventory. And then uh, finally started back uphill, you know, uh, from about 2016. Until now. Until now, yeah. We got, we, yeah, fucking pandemic hit in 2020, yeah, yeah. right? So yeah. we'll get to, I want to talk about that, about about handling the shop in, in a pandemic, because I think that's a, that's a good subject. But just before then, how, how, and again, share as, as little or how much as you're, you're comfortable 
again, going back to business lessons and again, inside skiing, inside snow sports, you have 10 years of growth, of success inside uh, a market, aka action sports that is hard to have success in. You have your growth and then everything kind of crumbles a bit. You have to, to downsize. How did that whole situation go? And was there any time where you were like, okay, access is just going to close off? Yeah, I guess I guess I should have weighed that option maybe more. So here's the thing is that being being maybe too um I wouldn't say cocky but being too how do you say in English fier proud like fier. too much pride too, too much pride to to sink the ship. Mm. So we should have sunk the ship in 2060 15 16 and just pushed the button restart. Cuz when I look around, you know, there's so many people that have done that and that are still that are still doing very well mm -hmm. as of we speak of today. And I'm not going to name any names, but that, that would have probably been a way to do it, which I wouldn't have lost millions of dollars, mm. but my pride was too strong. And I said, no, I don't want to, and it's going to affect the brand. There's no way, you know, it's like almost accepting a defeat, but sometimes you kind of, kind of have to accept that defeat to build, you know, build better to, to rebuild, you know, with stronger foundation Anyways, we didn't do it. We took we took the hard way, and I don't regret that. It's just how you learn from it. But like you mentioned, you go from having everything to 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 being you know winning an award, uh, North American uh, Sports Shop of the Year, to to being like the lowest of lows where reps don't even call you anymore. Or, you know, they they suppliers just you know call you to, to collect and give you shit and and. And that was all backlash from franchisees that were not handling it well. Well, yeah, and our mistakes of also opening shops underfinanced. Right. Right. So, so yeah, so from, from nice cool dreads in, <laughs> in 2002 and being all cool and in 2015 being all gray-haired because of all the stress. <laughs> At least I'm not losing it, but yeah, a lot of stress that was, it was felt back in those days, but. I guess I guess when you always have to go back to the simple things where you know family was family was happy healthy I was healthy stressed out out of my mind but and so that's what kind of got me through it and you know fucking put your put your head down and work take me through the 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 plan of you 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 said not sinking the ship and just like going through the storm what was your your red flag that something was coming and how, what you what was your um you're thinking when you downsize and like what was your process of like going from okay what is the red flag and how am i gonna go through that like there wasn't a master plan really it was more like honestly just holding on to whatever i could not to sink mm -hmm. so it was juggling with cash flow you know like where we really knew we had a hard time was that when we finished the season where we we owed probably more than what we had in inventory. Okay. So when you think about it, let's say you owe, I don't know, hundred dollars to somebody, but you only have $80 to sell. So you're down 20 bucks. Yeah. So you're screwed, right? If you don't somehow generate money quickly and flip that 80 into like double, double, double quickly, then you're screwed. So, one thing we knew is that we had the brand was not completely dead. We still had support from a lot of people, a lot of riders. And what we realized is that a lot of people probably didn't see the difficulties we had in the, in the back end. Mm -hmm. So they, they, the brand was still good. It wasn't obviously as strong as on a uh, selling side, meaning that we didn't sell as much access gear, but the store itself managed pretty well. So sales weren't really affected. In, in, in those terms, we're only affected by the lack of inventory in the shop or the lack of good inventory in the shop. So we, so we knew if we just kind of hung on and, and did our best to try to turn the inventory as much as possible and, you know, doing, you know, smaller buys, but better buys, then we might get through it. And that's how we handled it. We just, you know, tried to, to we went from ordering a lot of product back to ordering too little product, not enough to make the numbers enough to, to, to you know, to, to pay the bills, but to pay the, the, the rent and then the employees. Mm -hmm. So we kind of had to find a, 
the perfect balance in in those years where we could barely survive but you know we make enough just to build a little more and build a little more and build a little more and that that'll probably be the best way to take us into this pandemic where we were at that point in 2019 where we were we had built back a little bit but again this the 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 the, the curve and the scale was really not fast enough where we could be you know back to where we should be hmm. in terms of volume in 2020 there was a virus of unknown origins that hit <laughs> we, we do let's we not did. get into yeah let's <laughs> not get into that <laughs> we we had a um a couple small talks about it but every time i saw you at the shop i was like hey scott how's business going how are you affected and every time you were kind of saying hey business is booming yeah T tell me how, how was uh, the pandemic because the pandemic for a free skier was how we saw it is resorts closed um a lot of events were canceled uh you know it kind of seemed really brim for is it a word brim it seemed kind of dark for for a lot of um different sides of the industry but the only one that that i saw positives was when i was seeing you and you were like dude business is booming Yeah, I kind of felt bad talking about like the, uh, the, the all the positive sides of that because uh, it's not it wasn't the same for all the businesses. I think I really have a feeling that half the businesses did really bad and half did really good. So so when that hit in in in, in March, I was like, oh no, here we go again because I had already we'd already started climbing the hill back up, and I was like, all right, here we go. Somebody fucking you know hit us and we're like right at the bottom again, even lower than what we used to be because all the, the shops were going to be closed. And because, the, you know, the like you mentioned before, the, the resorts were going to be closed and everything. So it kind of took us a week to realize that, wait a sec, people are buying, they're buying the same, but they're all buying online. Mm. So all the operations costs have gone down and we're almost selling as much. Mm. So it took me a, a week. Because you don't need all those employees to greet people and... Ah. Well, I mean, we needed those employees, but we didn't, I guess, need as many hours as them or we didn't, you know, we could let the, we could keep the better ones and let the, yeah. the, the, the not so good ones, maybe at least the government would take care of them. So we wouldn't feel as bad to let them go. <laughs> um, no, I'm joking with that, but because um, it was pretty much a, a period where the, the staff was low anyways in the shop uh, being that time of the season. So yeah, worried for a week and then everything kind of picked up and then we we were I think we were set up online where we had the the right building blocks in in place and that 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 really boosted our online sales and I wouldn't say online sales but online operations and it taught us a lot about the online how where you need to be at to be competitive via the market. And so so some people adapted and some didn't and the ones that didn't adapt online those are the ones who lost and and I'm, i'm not going too far here but i guess some some people will understand what i'm trying to say here is that the other way around online success throughout this pandemic where we're reaching the we're, we've already at the end of it but you also have to scale it back the other way now things seem to be going back in store right now and losing momentum online and people need to adapt And I think you need to adapt quickly both ways. And it seems like not everybody has the same, not everybody has the same um, speed of adaptation or I don't know how to put it, but yeah, it, it seems like we, we were able to adapt throughout all those different waves. When you were, when we were talking about the, the whole history of access, you said, you know, at some point sky was the limit and maybe you were thinking big picture instead of looking at the smaller details. And when you scaled down, you went back to look, you know, handling the micro details of the business. Um, how was it exactly for that period of the pandemic going from uncertainty? And then, you know, I'm guessing there, there's a lot of details going into a retail business where it's like, there's maybe some acts you know in between selling t-shirts and shoes and skateboards and snowboards there's some products that you need more of there's some products that sell more there and then you go into the pandemic where a lot of people instead of going down south they want to buy some some sporting gear you know there's a whole lot of demand that changes and you got to adapt in a in a week or in the, you know 
because eh, the whole world comes to a stop and a lot of the demand is different from one day to another. Cr crazy things went on and are still kind of going on with that. I mean, the whole, I mean, retailers had a hard time to adapt. Uh, distributors, brands had also a hard time to adapt, meaning that they, they, they didn't have zero control on their production anymore. Hmm. Everything was mostly coming in from China and we know what happened there. Production was closed down in certain places. Shipping were also, you know, completely unorganized, not unorganized, but unavailable, let's say, yeah. uh, shipping via boat. So that, that changed everything where people would, would, you know, would buy so little and now would, they would buy the double, the triple. And then 2021, we, we ordered a lot and we didn't, we got shipped maybe 50% of what we ordered. Mm. And so like we're building in 2021 to 22, but 2022 to 23 week, I think a lot of people kind of did the same thing. They kind of bought more than what they really needed, expecting people to be still be spending a lot of money and expecting the brands not to be delivering as much as they did. But all the, the suppliers and brands ended up um, <laughs> uh, uh, delivering everything that was booked, but not on time. So it's kind of like a curveball again in the industry right now where there's a lot of overstock mm. that was shipped late during the season. It's a lot of puzzles that you got to deal with. Every every year it's a new puzzle. <laughs> so yeah, it's a lot of... But I, that's business. I'm pretty sure that's business. I'm pretty sure it's not only towards our action sports industry. Obviously, the our industry is is basically, in my opinion, built on... on let's put it simply like this, on fun. You know, it's supposed to be fun, right? So, yeah. and let's say sometimes maybe people aren't as serious as they should be <laughs> or aren't as punctual as they should be or aren't as focused as they should be. And and that's the good and the bad part of it is that sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes a lot of times um, things just don't get done as quickly as they what they should in other industries and we, we kind of lag. Yeah. As a, as a whole, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the whole yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we were kind of, yeah. But sometimes we don't react as fast as what we should. And, and by the time we do react, it, I mean, sell is shipped. Yeah. So, and I'm not saying that, you know, and, and but I'm just, not everybody's the same way, but yeah. So it's, 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 it's different struggles for sure. We have, I guess, when we do hit puzzles like that, our industry gets affected a little more because of our, mm -hmm. because of our no, no challenge. <laughs> One thing that, that I'm curious to have you, your, your thoughts on is uh, how did your sales and the, the types of product you sell change during the pandemic? Because um, the example I gave a couple times in other episodes is from one season to another, I had friends that weren't into skiing at all that were buying like brand new touring gear. You know, there was an increase, huge increase in demand for locally done snow sport activities let's say and i'm guessing that that's been the case in quebec but that must have been like all across the world almost like everyone instead of going to their trip in italy they're stuck at home so it's like okay what am i going to do there were that i think we're getting the better end out of this part meaning that they're stuck locally there i mean for for the worst season i think we're stuck within our country right yeah So, so being stuck within our country, there's still a lot of nice skiing and snow to get done. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's know, what I mean. If, How did that yeah, affect yeah, yeah. the hundred percent positive? Uh, now, what we what we need to see in the future is that how many of those people will stick to it. Mm -hmm. You know, and what I've been hearing from the mountain bike side, which has like six months in advance from us, is that most of the people are still sticking because once you've done it. And I mean, once you've gone touring once or once you've gone, you know, um, mountain biking or, or what one thing is for sure is that the whole the whole freestyle scene, the whole park scene, let's call it the park scene that has not changed and will probably not change. Kids will be kids and you give them rails and jumps. They'll be there. Mm -hmm. you, you put a hot map on, on a ski hill. <laughs> you know, the, the hot maps they have on the internet and they, they kind of um, evaluate where the, the most uh, traffic is. So, so if you, let's say you put a camera that could identify like what, where the most solicited part of the mountain would be, 100% would be the park all the time. Like times 10 of all the other runs, right? So that, that part of the business is really healthy. 
I don't think it brought in that many more people because it was already, you know, a lot of people there. But like you've mentioned before, all the touring or, I guess, free ride uh, aspect, that got boosted quite a bit. Now, the thing is that will those people keep on doing it? That That's a, a good question. But it seems like they're, they didn't lose that much in, in, in uh, mountain biking. I don't think we'll be losing as much in skiing and snowboarding. But obviously, those kind of people don't buy brand new pairs of skis every season. So that 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 might be a challenge in terms of of keeping you know numbers correct. Future future will tell. Uh, you know, it'll take a couple of years to know. It will, but at least it get it got more people out. It got more people involved in our sports, and it got more people to you know to to fall in love with our sport, which is, in my opinion, a hundred percent positive. Let, let's talk about this positive because there's so many negatives about this whole pandemic. That let's just stick on the, the positive. How is the evolution of retail um, for a ski shop been? Meaning that there's been the, we've talked about it just a bit, but the evolution of online sales in a world where for many people, as much as there are people buying skis online nowadays, there's also a lot of people that want to touch it and feel it. And you're kind of in that in-between where you have your actual ski shop, but you also have an online shop. How has that old transition been for a, a you know, a old uh, brick and mortar shop? I think, I think we, like anybody, any, anybody, like any business has to adapt. So I think we've, you should need to learn to adapt and, and not necessarily forget older ways of, of doing things like brick and mortar aren't out by any means. Hmm. So I think if you can just juggle in between both and, and find the right tuning, because every every business, even within its own comp- competition, has their own perfect tuning, and you just have to find that tuning in that in that good spot. And once you once you do find the the, the variables, and I think you're you're good. But yeah, you have to, you definitely have to adapt quickly. Because I think what you said is interesting. Because let's say from a clothing perspective, outside of snow sports, to me it seems like the brick and mortar is kind of dying. You go to shopping malls and there's a lot of empty shops. There's a lot of shops that are closing as if, you know, online sales are really the way now. But again, going back to snow sports and action sports, it is still alive and well. I'm, I'm touching wood right now, but we're at the bottom of the hill. So there will always be a need for us to be there, meaning that people will forget their goggles or gloves or whatever. People will have problems with their equipment or people will just come in to chat to see what the new you know, skis are now, what the new technologies are. Now, if we don't adapt to sell to them what they need, then that's our own fault. That's not the internet's fault. That's not, you know, who, you know, whoever's doing whatever people have to see value when they're going to buy from our shop. So we just need to offer that, that proper value and, you know, offer the, the things they need or else they just won't buy it here. So we need to adapt. And, and if you don't, then don't complain, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well said. don't complain, meaning the internet is, you know, it's the, yeah, yeah, sure. The internet's no good, but I mean, there's always, you know, you can be part of it or, you know, you, you can just yeah. complain and, and, have it pass you you can uh ride the wave or trying to swim against it exactly yeah um you mentioned it uh at the beginning of the episode when you were talking about starting your shop and wanting to promote the sport wanting to promote the athletes um that's a big point that i wanted to touch on with axis because you have been promoting the sport i'd say in relation to your capacity because you're not red bull as much as any other brands I've seen inside of skiing. So aside from a question, big shout out to you guys for what you've done in the past 20 years. And maybe what we can start touching on is, you know, the implication you've had because the from the athletes you've supported to the film projects, to the events, um, you guys have, you know, if you have to, to do a listing of the, the Quebec culture, the East Coast culture of freestyle, it's all, it always links back to you. You, you guys are behind that all the way through in the last 20 years. Yeah, I guess we never, it's not, we didn't think about it. It's just for us, it was like always part of our life. I think it's important to be part of your life. And that's, 
I think that's probably got us through all the harder parts is that people, I think, do realize and they understand that that we live for this. This is this is what, you know, drives us. This is what, you know, always has, always probably will. Um, obviously, we're getting older now. So every event we do, <laughs> we're a little more tired at the end. But <laughs> but uh, but we, we love doing it. We love doing it. And 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 it's I get the feeling is that if, if we weren't going to do it, who would? I don't want I don't want a snowboarding or skiing event being organized by somebody that has you know no part of the industry. I want to make sure that that people that do organize those events know what's going on, know what to promote, know what brands to promote, know what athletes to promote, and and not just run a circus show. You know, so I kind of I kind of I, I we love doing it, but we also kind of feel the responsibility of keeping on doing it to make sure it's done right. And don't get me wrong. It's not that I don't want to pass the torch. I mean, <laughs> anybody listening, all the kids there, <laughs> if you want to run events, come see me, man. You can, you can, you can run away with a few. Um, but, but yeah, um, I, I, I hope we'll never stop doing it because that's what keeps us, you know, keeps, keeps us in it. It's what keeps us young, what keeps the local industry and regional industry going, in my opinion. That's very well said. And I think what's cool And maybe that what did your success is you weren't looking at it from an accountant point of view, oh, saying zero. like, oh, we're putting that amount of time and money into that event because it feels like for a lot of brands or hills or resorts, whatever, they look at it from an accountant point of view and sometimes lose touch of the uh, intangibles. And that's something that helped you guys a lot is you looked at it just from a passion point of view, but with all those things that you put together, that's what created the Axis brand and made your success. Yeah, you're right. And, and that's a good thing and a bad thing. That's not really, a, I guess it wouldn't be a proper business way to look at it. Um, and and I, I do understand that now. So there's, there's obviously some finances you have to look at when you're putting on an event, maybe that we wouldn't look at before. Some evaluations that anyways, that have to be done. But uh, But yeah, I don't think, we should never see it as a, a business of putting on an event to be making money. If, if anything, we should, we should hope to break even, but, but I say that with, with, with all due respect with other people that have put, put on, you know, good events in the past, some of them that don't exist anymore that have kind of turned it into a business and that have also kept the integrity of the culture. And I don't take anything away from that. Because if they can, if they can squeeze some money out of big corporations, let's, let's, you'll understand where I'm going with this with Videotron, let's say, yeah, and make their event worthwhile, 100%. But lift, lift my, off, my hat off to them. I wish they could do it again, you know? Mm -hmm. We're talking about the shakedown. Well, I don't, I don't want to throw out names, but no, I mean, no, just for people's sake, because it was a slope style snowboarding event. That was held in Saint Sauveur for 15 years, maybe, in the from the yeah. early 2000s to the mid 2010s, and that you know, it was as mainstream as an event as I ever seen in Quebec, where you had people driving from Montreal to Saint Sauveur, and the town was filled with tens of thousands of people to see a snowboarding event, which is a feat in itself that I've never seen anywhere else in our East Coast world. Yeah. Yeah, so I lift my half my head off to the to those guys, Pat and uh, Brendan, and and they kind of turned it into a business where they didn't, you know, they were, and that's fine because they they did it so well that I mean we didn't we need more contests like that, you know, mm. but we never we never took events uh, in, in in the same way or we didn't have I guess the maturity or the time or the skills to approach it the same way. Mm -hmm. Well, because you were a ski shop putting on events and not necessarily an event production company. Yeah. But they kind of started off as the empire shakedown and then they, the two, two yeah, like yeah. Pat, Pat and Brendan kind of phased off into their own business of creating that event, which, which turned out well, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's funny because we had the, I had, well, I had a, a talk with them uh, during the pandemic And we touched back on the shakedown and I kind of asked him, well, guys, when, you know, when are you going to be doing the skiing side of the shakedown? Because that's all you'd hear, right? All the skiers saying, well, why is there a skate, uh, shakedown for skiing? And those guys were really, you know, rooted into snowboarding. And I respect that. And they were like, well, maybe you should organize it, Scott. I'm like, <laughs> ah, <nah. laughs> I'll keep on doing what I'm doing. But yeah, 
I, I really want to touch on a lot of events you've done and have your your thoughts on where it comes from, your your memories from it, and you know, to give people a perspective on all that's done. Because and I think it should be kind of rapid fire because or there's so much to talk with you that I think we'd still be sitting down tonight. Yeah. But um it, it's great to to like go back and talk about everything you've done. So you've been implicated with the local hill, uh Saint Sauveur for since your inception. You've been doing events with them. And Saint Sauveur has a water park in the summer, which um you know, anyone in that area knows well, and it's, you know, it's, it's loved. Everyone has great memories from there. And for years, you, when people would say, oh, it's not worth it to do an event during the summer, people are not into snow sports during the summer, you put in rail jams at the water park in between like the, the, the water slides for snowboarding and skiing for years. Tell me about that. All right, I'm not going to take too much credit on that, right? Because they're, they're credit. I mean, credit has to be given where credit is due. Is Saint Sauveur approached that? What Summit they call it back then? It was Mont Saint Sauveur, but Summit approached that with that product. They used to run the um, what, what do they call it? The Folie Sur Neige, right? Which is this, was a ski hill that you had to dress up. It was like a course that you jump in the water, right? Yeah. So that would that would touch, you know, anybody that would kind of you know. It wouldn't touch like the the freestyle side of the whole industry, right? Like mm-hmm. kids didn't care about dressing up and jumping in the water, but then they kind of they had they knew they had to kind of adapt. So they proposed to us one year, I think it was two thousand four, to have that in on the hill, like you mentioned, and have two rails, and then that took off, and then the next year is like to slide the wave pool, and there's there's videos on there you know, on the on YouTube uh, where you can see the junkyard jib, which yeah. was the name of the event. I think that was the best year. And and yeah, there's a whole whole the uh, rail line set up with um, with a few few hits, few bonks. When you're a teen and you're into you know skiing, snowboarding, whatever, you're you're just craving for those events. And it was so cool for you guys to put it on because they it was, everyone from from the Quebec community was going there, swimsuit on, but also with with the like long tees or whatever tall tees, <laughs> and it. When you look back at that, it's like once it's done, you're like, no shit, it was a success. It's like everyone's craving for that, but you still have to. It's a lot of effort to to put a, a rail course in the middle of the summer when it's 30 degrees Celsius. Well, here's the thing. Like I mentioned before, I think you know you have to give credit where credit is due. Where Saint Sauveur had the the vision of having that event and and hosting a whole bunch of fucking teenagers that don't pick up or they they phone bordel or they really you know yeah they, they're not very respectable of their environment so they, they 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 accepted us and plus we had all the the beer money for the course light where they invested heavily into action sports mm. and they just paid for everything because when you look at it at, at, at a business point of view once again there's no way you can make that event profitable no way zero like you're going to charge Five hundred dollars per person to make that to you know, to compete in that event. Like, yeah. Just the snow, I think, would cost like fifteen thousand just to have like the the snow chip there, and and that doesn't that, that that's not like all the mechanics that come with it. Meaning that you needed uh, lifts and, and and shovel, not shovels, but um, cat. Well, not not cats because I mean it was it wasn't there wasn't enough snow to have a snow a snow cat, but like uh, like all the. Um, the uh, the pel the pel mechanic what do you call them shovels like the the mechanical shovels yeah right and all the lifts and all everything to 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 put that snow out but mm-hmm. I think it comes back once again to to say so we're accepting us so, uh, of course like putting out that money and especially the low I mean this is another thing we didn't touch on I think we need we need to give a lot more thanks and and give a lot more credit to all the local riders but also clients and, and, and friends and kids that supported the shop and that have always supported the shop that every time we hold an event, they come, I mean, hundred percent benevol, hundred percent for free, pick up a shovel and help us put up, you know, put a course on. Mm-hmm. And we had a lot of love. I think we give a lot of love out via events or sponsorship or good gear or goodies or whatever, but we get a lot of love also from that and from, from those local you know, kids mm-hmm. and supporters. And I'd say that's a, that's a good point that you're touching on because I've seen love shown to Axis more than any other brands I've seen in my life. But also, to your point, you've, you're giving um, 
a lot more love than any other brand I've seen. So, you know, it's a, it's a good virtuous circle that you've created with your shop where, uh, you know, people are stoked to rep your, the, the shop they're sponsored by more than any other people I've seen. Cause they're also getting more love than any other people by their own shop or, you know, it's a, yeah. Yeah. it's a family thing that you've built where like you give back. So then people want to give back and it just keeps on kind of yeah. growing. Yeah. Hopefully we can keep it that way. So yeah, that's what we keep. And then, yeah. And then the A camp was running also at the same time, pretty much 2008, I think, which is another crazy one. To put people in context again, for East Coasters, what's the, the solution in the summer if you want to ski? You go to Whistler, or you go to Hood. It's pricey. It's not for, you know, not everyone gets to go there. And you guys came up with the crazy idea of what if we had something like that in Quebec? Again, I'm not going to take the credit for it because it wasn't Axis that came up with it. Again, but tell me the story because you were involved in it in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there was the first idea was Max Brochu. He used to work for the shop or he, used, he worked at the shop back then. And he, he had the idea of, of, of putting a whole bunch of snow together with snow cats and, and putting um, hay over it to keep to conserve it for at least two months after the winter season had ended. It ended. And then to, to, to put it out and to, to have a, a small park during the summer at the end of, of June. And so everybody thought he was crazy, right? So he, he kind of did, he kind of put the hay. He need to say who he did it with, but he kind of put that hay on that snow, like almost like 500 haystacks by himself that, that spring just to conserve the snow and everybody, well, no, it's going to melt and you're doing that for nothing and you just wasted your time and money and blah, 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 blah. So, so it was just a theory like, oh, I think it could work? Exactly. <laughs> Good old fashioned hay on the snow and we'll keep it like they did the refrigerators back in the days, right? Yeah. So, and it worked and it worked and it, we they had like a 40 foot jump, I think that first summer and also rails. So, you know, instant success, but once again, um, not not an easy business to make profitable because it costs so much to to put in that snow together and to build that huge mountain that's like ten stories high of snow and and putting hay over it that also costs money and labor, and afterwards, you know, putting out that snow and and pulling it out to to to, to have a flat course to to put some rails on or jumps. So yeah. yeah. So again, not necessarily something that's profitable at all, just something done by people who love it and want to give back and are passionate. 100% passion, 100% passion. And yeah, yeah. And they've, they've kind of, you know, we kind of took that torch in between where Max didn't do it anymore. We kind of did it, but it was pretty heavy for the shop to absorb that uh, in terms of time and, and time and, and quality um, uh, put the, the just you know energy put towards that and then dave uh, dave brown dave fournier took it now and is running it for like four years and he's doing a super well good job mm -hmm. so yeah and after a hiatus of pandemic it's coming back this summer coming back this summer yeah yeah only only place where you can ride the summer on the northern east coast that's sick yeah pretty good i'll pretty have good. to go do some laps this summer for sure um then another rail jam that that i wanted to touch on again to give flowers to you guys because you've put on things that are insane and that takes a lot of effort as we're, we just said many times but also some crazy ideas one of the the sickest rail jam that doesn't exist anymore that you need to put back uh, i'm kidding but that was super fun and original it was the taxes hold'em dude we want to bring it we want to bring it back so much <laughs> it's so it, much it was an early season rail jam so it kind of started the season for the whole Quebec scene and the whole concept behind it was there was maybe I'm wrong or maybe it evolved I'll let you correct me but there was qualifiers as a normal rail jam but once you got into finals it was kind of a poker game where everyone had chips and would bet on their tricks and yeah so so it started off where it was only invite only snowboarding only invite And then we got a whole bunch of shit from Remo. <laughs> <laughs> from Frank Sony, Remo. Frank Remo. No, I'm, I'm sorry, but a whole bunch of the whole the whole skiers were like, hey, what the hell? Why are you holding this event? I mean, aren't you selling both ski and snowboarding? You should have also, you know. So we kind of yeah, you guys are right. <laughs> we should have it for skiing also. So we opened it up for skiing, I think, in 2007. And and then by then so many people wanted to get involved that we did need to do qualifiers to get people. But there was our I think there was pre-qualified 
riders also that were had like a pass and invite. And yeah, so the final table would be people would start off with 200 bucks of chips. And we had special access chips made, which, we, which I still have that I found the other day. And then they would bet on a trick. and that, So everybody would hide their trick, write down a trick, hide it in a, on a card. And then when you're at the, at the top of that hill, you have to, to do that, that. So everybody would bet, but not knowing what other tricks people had called. And every person had to do their own tricks that they'd written, the, you know, written on the card. And then the best, the person that would do it the best would, would win that, that pot. And then we go till there's no more money. And so I guess eight riders times 200 would give us a thousand six. We'd split up and whatever. That's such a sick concept. I, I remember it was a bit hard to follow um, for a viewer on the outside because you were not necessarily seeing the details, but just as a concept and for the riders, I think it was one of the more beloved events. The more you get into a specific concept, the harder it is to actually pull it out. Yeah. And get something that that's a... Uh, but but to touch to touch on this, I think we've always created events uh, first and foremost for the riders and not the spectators. So I, again, I'm not sure if that's a proper way to do it in terms of a business strategy. But in terms of a credibility and long term, I think it's better that way. Because if you get approval from the riders, usually the rest will follow. If you don't get approval, if you get disapproval from the riders, you're risking a lot more. Some You were talking about doing things for the athletes. Again, nowadays, we see less and less um, independent events, let's say. It's mostly like FIS re related events, you know, national events, provincial events, whatever. For the event, I don't think it exists anymore, but it ran for almost 20 years. The Axis Slope Style was a slope style event put on by you guys that was skiing and snowboarding. Ran really well. That was pretty much the best and biggest slope style event in Quebec, at least. Or, you, you know, some would go as far as the East Coast, but let's say in Quebec, definitely. I'm guessing it, you know, the inception, it starts at a point where you're like, oh, hey, slope style would be cool. There's no slope style events. Let's do one. That's exactly it. So we had a crazy idea of holding a slope style, but from top to bottom of that run, which had about, I'd say, 10 different modules, yeah, rails, a mix of rails. And, and, and we thought, well, yeah, that's going to run no problem. Opened up the uh, snowboarding and skiing inscriptions and had like, 220 people sign up right so you're trying to qualify on 10 like 10 different modules 220 people like, it, like the, the, the task was just it, it, it wasn't even doable you know it's crazy yeah and was that on the first year or that was after a couple of years first year first year but then we kind of didn't learn fast enough but that was the first year which was fucking just crazy nuts it, it, we had the um the wall right at the bottom i don't know if you remember which was also something kind of new in a, a course yeah. in, in, in 2002. And, and I remember we didn't get it right on, we didn't get the judging right at all on the skiing and snowboarding. I remember, I think it was Jeff Ull that really got robbed there. Like there's a few people that got robbed just because we didn't have the right, the judges weren't set up in the right place with the right tabulations, with the right system. The system wasn't in place yet. We didn't know how to operate it really. You know, we were just kind of winging it, winging it off yeah so yeah it's unfortunate so my apologies to anybody who got under judge in that contest and i do remember some commotion at the end because there was still some dollars involved and and as much as dollars were also involved there's kind of recognition to mm -hmm. be to be had there i mean if you would win the slope sale back then we kind of put your stamp on the the regional you know provincial market market not market but uh, stage so we kind of got better with it throughout the years and then it seems like and it's like a lot of major top athletes went through that, you know, that, that, you know, B Dog was in there, Belmar, uh, Bémil, uh, Bergeron was there, yeah. Ull did it, uh, Adams, well, Nicky Adams back, back then was, you know, maybe more known than, than <laughs> right now, but, and on the snowboarding side also, I mean, you got, I mean, Laurie Blouin, Toutain went in through there, uh, Parot, they all went through the, that contest. So, 
that's that's kind of cool to see now that like a lot of those athletes have, have you know gotten really you know high up in the sports mm-hmm. the, the, the highest levels yeah pretty much every quebec pro that's been out in the last 15 years has either been directly supported by you guys or benefited from events that you've put on yeah well i mean i, I don't I'm not that i don't like to see it that way but we we benefit did we we benefited more from them being there than what they did from us so it's kind of like yeah okay. but i i mean it's mutually beneficial but yeah, I, yeah. yeah if I when you look back at it like let's say emil before winning a medal at x games eventually had to make his steps and a lot of that was through axis slope style and taxes hold them i remember like there was big names alexi godbu alex belmar dumb laporte yeah, doing cool. the taxes yeah. hold them and there was small tiny emil that was three feet tall, the rail was higher than him, and he made finals. And it's awesome for kids to have those stages where they can shine, they can make a name for themselves, because you don't get from nobody to X Games Gold in one step. You need those steps, and it's awesome that you guys made them happen, because that's a great example. Emil went from a, a small kid that was really good, that was inspired by his big bro, And he eventually won an X Games medal. But in that meantime, I remember young Emil going to access comps and impressing everyone. Yeah, yeah. If I use small back then, eh? With his long, long, long T. <laughs> tall, 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 tall T. I remember Emil smaller than Darrell and like having to jump for his life to get the lip to. And it wasn't the best looking, but everyone was just so hyped because that kid was 12 years old, 11, whatever. Yeah. And yeah. it was so sick to see him. And he was competing against like Godbu, who was a pro at that time. Yeah, yeah, Godbu. It's still running, really running, still running good, OS. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, that slope style, unfortunately, what happened is that it seems like the demographic kind of got older. So we kind of got the initial part of that. Because if you look at the demographic of ages and the number of people in, in those in that category it seems like they kind of got older with that event and and then we kind of transferred over to the junior games which would be the the next demography of kids the next you know um i guess pool of kids that would would follow in that contest and right now that's what we're still in you, you, so you rebranded it kind of from a pro event quote unquote back in the days where it was like we're looking for the best of the best come and and you know fight for the cash to Today, the Junior Games, which is kind of a um, slope style event for young kids to get introduced to the sport. Exactly. So finally, I finally, I think the kids are kind of back to that. I think the, the demography and the way the, the 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 cycle is made is that I think we'll be seeing maybe more and more of higher level contests because kids are getting the pool of kids in, in that category is getting bigger and bigger. And I think it says a lot about the sport that you're actually able or that of the 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 road that that you that has been done for free skiing and snowboarding where versus 20 years ago where when you started access slope style it's not as if you could have even had a comp for 10 12 13 year olds because there wasn't enough you know the sport was still new and nowadays you're able to do a full comp with the junior games because the sport uh, the sports have grown so much that there's actual hundreds of kids that want to to do a slope style comps and they're nine years old or, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. This has changed a lot. I mean, back in 2002, we didn't have the Olympics. Now we have the Olympics. So that has also changed a lot for better or for worse. <laughs> well, what's your perspective on that as a passionate of the sport, but also as a businessman, someone who puts on events, what's the, the positive and negatives that you see from that? I don't know. I guess, I guess I always flip, I flip opinions on that maybe too much to to talk about it because sometimes <laughs> I see it as like a, the best thing and sometimes it's the worst thing. And so I guess I'm just, I'm just too much old school to, to express maybe anything. But I mean, on a local level, let's say, because as much as you have your, your hand on a global level, you know, you deal with brands around the world and you, you understand the global market. How have you seen it evolve in on a local scale? Well, obviously, I mean, more people are in the sport. More, there's more cre- credibility of the sport, uh, get more attention. But then again, you get people in the sport for the wrong reasons, not necessarily because they want to have fun riding skis or snowboards. They want to get into it to have the scholarship or have the Olympic medal, you know? 
what's more important, the Olympic medal or the feeling you get on a on a jump? That that's a that's a good question to be asked. To I mean, everybody will have a different opinion on this one, but it forces a lot of athletes these days, I think, to consider that saying like, do you want to go down the road? Because comps are so demanding, schedule wise, that with all the comps and the trainings and the level you got to maintain to do your runs at the highest level, that it really requires the the skiers to ask themselves that question. Because if you're going on in the comp route, it's you're sacrificing a lot of other things, you know, whereas that's in the Tanner all days, he could do competitions, but he would also have three months or maybe two, whatever, enough time to go in Alaska, enough time to do other things. But right now it's so demanding that it asks the rider, like, do you really want to go that route? Because if you go down that route, there's other fun side of the sport that you're not going to get to do. Yeah, exactly. No. And I think that's, that's what people need to keep in perspective is, is make sure you're enjoying what you're doing. Because if you're only doing it to, to get to a certain point and you're not enjoying the, the process, then I'd get out of there, you know? We touched on it quickly, but I, I want to state the point. You've supported a lot of athletes through the days. From, as you've said, Philippe Poirier and some legends of the sport to uh, in the 2000s slash 2010s, guys like Godbu, guys like Phil Casabon, guys like Frank Raymond, until Dom Laporte, Belmar, a lot of names. And same same goes on, on the snowboarding side. Maybe I'd have some harder time listing them, but... You know, it goes both ways. Tell me about the importance you've you've put or you feel the athletes have to like represent a shop and vice versa, but also what as someone who sponsored athletes for 20 years, what what makes you tick? What what has made you choose each and every you know, each and every one of those guys that I've named were special and you know uh, they've proved that through the years, but what makes you tick as a someone who sponsors skiers that you make you say, okay, I, I want to, I want to um, support that guy. That's, it's, that's a, uh, well, I want to make sure I get this right. I'm not sure if I'm ready for this question. I, <laughs> to be honest with you, it's, um, it's as if, I guess uh, we, we never went out really. I mean, apart from our, I mean, Poirier or all the bigger athletes back in the days, it seems like we've always supported kids at a, a, lo- a younger stage. Yeah. And when we see the certain talent coming out of a certain kids, certain styles coming out of certain kids that we want to sponsor, it just seems like we're just trying to support them to live their, their passion and, and try to give them the, the best start or I guess the right guidance in our industry to, to, to make it to the right place. Is there a, a, a thing of, Helping them like reach their full potential, kind of. Well, they reach their own f- potential without us having to. You know, we we that we have no part in that. I mean, the athlete, the athlete will will will, will do that by himself. But, but I mean, they're still a part. If I've seen you support guys and helping them like get to ski to Whistler in the summer, and you know, a lot of things like that, where a couple a couple of those helps go a long way for a kid. Yeah. Well. You, I guess the way we see it is that there's, you know, there's visibility. I mean, it, it gets our brand out there. It speaks, you know, he, they, we usually ask for the riders to have at least a sticker or something where a piece of access clothing when they're out there. And that, that also helps the brand worldwide get recognition and credibility. So, and it gets a rider out there and, and I mean, obviously, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's always enjoyable or even, you know, fun to watch somebody from here succeed like matt last year won the uh, super unknown right yeah it's fine so i mean i mean hells yeah man i want to i want to help out as many kids as win as many contests like that as possible you know for sure yeah but but yeah um it's always it's obviously hard to support everybody but yeah we do try to you know try to, to hook up the the better ones Mm-hmm. Or at least the ones that have with the better mentality, because I think it really it's really important where you can have the talent, but if you don't have, if you don't have the right mindset or the right place in the industry, or, or if you you don't have the right actions in the park, you you might not be worth sponsoring. Well, can you elaborate on that? I'm curious on what do you mean with the the right mindset? You mind you mean in terms of representing a brand, or just in terms of how you carry yourself? How you carry yourself how you expose yourself on either social media or just 
via um you know um on the hill on the hill with with just interactions with other writers you know do you want to you know you want to be that guy that's always smiling and positive and talking to everybody you don't want to be that jerk that cuts everybody off and you know always complaining about the jump conditions and rail conditions you know and there are a lot of people like that so yeah you just want to i guess if you're positive you'll just spread more love and that's what we want yeah i feel you on that there's so much stuff that i'd like to talk to you about but i feel like it almost be good to do a part two at some point in the future because there's always more stuff happening and more stuff to talk about so maybe it'd be good to close it off with the patreon questions Go, um, go 100%. Basically, I've told, I have the people on Patreon. I tell them my guests coming on and they tell me questions they have for you. So first off, we have Sam Chef who asks, what's the favorite access event that you've put on or that you've sponsored throughout the years? Wow, that's a good one. So many of them. And it depend, depends on the year or, or anything. I guess I'd have to say we mentioned it before, like the taxes holding was so different and so unique that that I guess that would be fun. It would be a little stressful being down the, the poker table and, and kind of, you know, having to deal with all the eight different athletes, putting, placing bets and writing down it. I mean, that would kind of get hectic, but I, I kind of like that. Yeah. What, what was your role? Um, what was your role with that event uh, in the actual day of the event? Were you hands off and letting everything run its course or were you actually hands on? on the course that, that's i think that's probably one of my biggest quality or my biggest flaw is is being too involved right so you were at the poker table i was the dealer oh shit <laughs> i was at, yeah so it was kind of hectic you know kind of trying to run an event at the same time of running like yeah the specific part of the event but yeah taxes event i guess taxes holding was cool but there's so many good events i mean we're still having so many different cool events that they you know throughout the years i guess they they change or they You see him differently. Yeah. Um, next question is from Holden Baldassi, who asks, what's the vi favorite video project you supported throughout the years? Whew. So it could be, you know, the term video project evolved. Back in the days, it was movies, DVDs, whatever. But yeah. what, what's so, the one that you, stands out to you? So I wouldn't want to, because we supported a whole bunch of different uh, movies, some you've made and some you know others have made mm -hmm. i think the most important one that we have supported since day one and you'd probably you'd probably agree with this would be the the summit challenge yeah the the summit challenge that came the course light challenge that came the that that was the saint Saver challenge that you know so it was it was it wasn't a specific filmer editor or writer mm -hmm. It was the whole event that that was a, a mix-up of that. And when we see a lot, the same thing as the contest before, there's a lot of athletes that have gone really, you know, in, in a high place in this industry mm -hmm. that have passed through that creation yeah. of that video. Yeah. So again, to give people some context, everyone has seen it, but not everyone is familiar with the concept. It started off as a three-year, uh, not three-year, sorry, three days that from start to finish of those three days, you had to film and edit a full video with writing, but also a storyline or a concept of sorts. And at the end of the three days, you had to deliver it and everyone would watch it and, you know, choose a winner that would win. I think the winner was winning five grand. There was 10,000 in total. So it was great cash purse. And it evolved right now to where the, the, the timeline is, is less strict and you have more time to get it done, but it, get, it gave and it still gives a great, Uh, visibility for filmmakers and also writers and through the years you've had you know Dale Talkington from the states that when he was in the come up he was going there and uh, made crazy videos and you know Emile Bergeron Paul Bergeron uh, ABM Belmar uh, the, the list goes on of great Gagne. Vince Gagne that made Gosh. some great videos um, on their way to where they eventually got in the sport Yeah. Yeah. So that I think, yeah. So I guess, you know, that's, it's not a specific project, but it's more like a, but it's a, it's an event within that project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that gave life to the community because, um, you know, you have endless classics that came out of there that people are still watching 10 years later from both snowboarding and skiing. 
for anybody that's listening to this that's not really familiar with the concept, just go on Google and 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 um, search uh, either Coors Light Challenge or Saint Sauveur Challenge, and then we'll probably just throughout the, the you'll have uh, hundreds of videos to look hundreds. at hundreds. And, and you'll see, I mean, the creative, the writing and just the creative stories that come out of that is just, they're so amazing. Mm-hmm. So amazing to watch. And they last throughout the years, you know? Mm-hmm. So, Because the whole point was, again, I'm, uh, I've am i known the, the original organizer, J, J.F. Du Rocher, um, and shout out to also the other involved, Guillaume and, and JP. But basically... JP, that, yeah. I always forget JP, but yeah, shout out <laughs> to JP, man. Basically, the whole thing is, what we were seeing when the, that contest started was porn, ski porn edits. You know, it's just tricks. And the whole thing was, can you guys create a concept, a story that goes with it? But, you know, that is not just some uh, Tupac or Biggie with skiing. Like, can you put a story in that stands out? Because that's never been seen anywhere else, I think, or, you know, uh, almost. And it, it created some insane stories. People doing uh, Forrest Gump ripoffs, Others just creating totally original stories of uh, things that anyone that goes to a hill can relate, like dealing with a ski patrol or, de- you know, there, it's uh, it's insane what that, that has created as legacy of content. The list is endless and, and I think the possibilities also are endless. So, so yeah, we're hoping to keep that event alive. Maybe we're, we probably will bring it back to a shorter distance, which also was cool for the industry where it got everybody together in the park for a week or three days, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. you know, working on their project. And then you'd see somebody, you know, well, what are they working on? Or why he's, why is he dressed up or like that? Or why is he taking a shot the certain way? And, mm-hmm. and nobody would, nobody would sleep. Everybody would be editing. <laughs> so yeah, it was a good, uh, it was a good buildup to that, to that final showing of those, those videos. Um, then I have a question from one of your boy, Laurent Olivier Martin, who asks, where do you see the sh- the future of the shop? What's your your uh, your your vision for the next couple of years? Whew. Where do I see the future of the shop? Yeah, that's it's not unfortunate, I guess. You you need to embrace and adapt, and but yeah, we're we're getting into we're lucky enough that our sport is physical, right? So we're not we're not selling video games. Okay, so our sport is physical, meaning that people will always be on the mountain. So there will always be an interaction with real people. And, and it's so enjoyable to do it that it, you're not going to be able to say, well, VR is going to replace that, that feeling you get when you hit a jump or a rail. Zero. Never. You can simulate it somehow, but you'll never be able to have the same feeling. So I think in, in that case, I think we're pretty safe. And, but we definitely will probably need to adapt where if we do want to keep on doing good good business online, everything will be virtual soon. We'll be in the metaverse and people will be coming in our shop through the fucking metaverse and talking to whoever character and holding the pair of skis and turning it around and seeing it. But yeah, we're laughing, but that's man, for the good or for worse. That's where it's going, right? And the more that, that technology increases, the more it, it becomes a split for you guys on the business end where a kid that's super tech savvy will want to go in the metaverse to check out the Armada. But then someone who's less tech savvy will want to go and talk to a real human and touch the skis. So it's like a big split. That's where I think you need to let, I mean, that's where the, the, that's where I, that's where I mentioned before brick and motor is really important, but you you still need to do a, this amazing job online. And if you do both of those halfway, then you're not in the game. You have to do, it's just, everybody's got to raise or level up, you know, in shop and online in our part anyway. So that's where I, that's where I see it going in a few years is that we're going to have to just more work, <laughs> I guess, more work, making sure we keep those clients happy. Yeah. And well informed, you know, properly informed. Right. Because you can pick up that ski boot, right? And you can look at it what, however you want to, but you'll never be able to try it on, see that proper fit. And that fucking craziness of shipping, shipping back and reshipping, that doesn't make sense either. So, so yeah, I think we, we will definitely always have a physical location. Thanks a lot for doing an episode, Scott. I really appreciate it. Um, I think people are going to really enjoy this episode. And um, 
Yeah, man. Long live uh, Axis. Hope uh, you get you get another uh, twenty years of less roller coaster. Still a, a lot of success. Hey, roller coasters are part of life, you know. Riding the waves, you know. Waves come, <laughs> waves go, and then you just got to catch the next one. So yeah, we'll be we'll be here twenty years from now. And and thanks thanks for having me. I hope we didn't bore too many people with the business aspect of this whole thing, but. But just remember, guys, it's all it's all fun and games, you know. If if you're not enjoying yourselves, then why are you doing it? <laughs> yeah, well said. Thanks a lot, Scott. Yeah. All right, Zach. So this is it for episode 41 with Scott Reeves. I hope you enjoyed it. Big thanks to the sponsors once again: Planks Clothing, Dickens Restaurants, and Axis Board Shop. Also, big thanks to the patrons on Patreon. If you want to support the podcast, check it out at patreoncom podcast. Peace. <laughs>